During this two-part presentation, we'll be discussing the new analyses performed at Yale University, not only on the Vinland map, but also on the manuscripts with which it is associated. It has been an ongoing story. We'd like to acknowledge the hard work that has been done on this project so far, with many thanks to our colleagues near and far, especially Team Titanium at Yale. The Vinland map has been hailed as the earliest depiction of America's coast, supposedly drawn over 50 years earlier than Columbus's famous voyage. Using the analytical methods available to scientists over the last seven decades, there have been numerous attempts to discover its age and authenticity. It's interesting that the Vinland map is rarely mentioned in context with the objects most closely related to it, the texts it was once a part of. These three items have an intertwined history, but have never been systematically examined together. Conservators at the Yale University Library have been able to work with scientists from Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, using new methods to examine them and find new information. By amazing coincidence, these two seemingly unrelated volumes arrived in New Haven, Connecticut at exactly the same time. Both reside at Yale's Beinecke Library, along with the map. Vincent de Beauvais' 15th century Speculum Historiale and the separately bound, single folio Historia Tartarorum of Debridia, known as the Tartar Relation. The Vinland map was found at the front of the Tartar Relation when the two volumes arrived at Yale. And the map itself, showing Vinlanda Insula, the puzzling inscription that will be addressed in part two, and the wormholes. Vincent de Beauvais, Speculum Historiale. The Beinecke Library's copy of the Speculum Historiale is the second volume of a popular medieval encyclopedia in four volumes. This copy is thought to have been written during the Council of Basel, which took place between 1431 and 1449. The Speculum was a common volume in medieval libraries. In Yale's copy, the Gothic script is similar to other examples of the time period, such as in this 15th century alchemical manuscript in Yale's collection, Mellon Manuscript 12, shown on the left, and the Beauvais on the right. It would be common to find repairs made to the binding or text of a book like the Speculum Historiale, which was likely a frequently used volume. This copy of the Speculum was rebacked in sheep leather. There are new repairs and end sheets and indications of newer sewing and end bands as well. You can clearly see the offset writing on the boards which was left behind when earlier paste downs were removed. Those paste downs had been made from a document dating to 1437, which is still readable in reverse. Using reflectance transformation imaging on the first opening, for the very first time it was clearly shown that the hardware on the boards and the deep indentations visible in the paper of the first page do not coincide. At some point, the boards of the speculum were switched, and the backboard became the front board. Shown here is the backboard. It's clear there's no hardware that could have made the marks we see on the paper of the first leaf. This can only mean that the boards are not original to the text. It's probable that these replacement boards were chosen specifically for the date that can be read in the offset writing. Not only the binding was altered, but the text as well. This close-up shows the pinkish remains of an ownership stamp, which was cut from the foot of a page. The bottom portion of the page was cut away and replaced with new material. The bottom edges of three leaves within the texts have been replaced this way, most likely in order to hide other owner's marks.
This um, simple stack of paper choirs or sections will help us visualize the choir diagram of the manuscripts. The diagram shows the folios of all three manuscripts. There are 15 choirs in the speculum on the right, and each choir is made from an outer folio of parchment, six paper folios, and an inner folio of parchment. Doctors Sarah Fidiment and Matthew Teasdale at Cambridge perform peptide mass fingerprinting using eraser crumb samples taken from each of these parchment folios to determine the species of animal used to make them. It was hoped that the information may help indicate the geographical location where the manuscript was made, but it turns out the speculum contains both calf and goat, and both types of animals were available in most parts of Europe during the Middle Ages. The red lines indicate goat parchment, the blue calf. The DNA of the samples was also analyzed. From the results at present, Dr. Teasdale has said that DNA evidence indicates the two halves of the Vinland map are likely from a single animal, as both the mitochondrial DNA genome and the sex of the animal seem to be the same. He goes on to caveat the results. Their analysis was hampered by significant levels of DNA damage in both samples, meaning that the mitochondrial DNA data from the Vinland map is only 88 percent complete at present. The comparable levels of damage between the samples is in itself encouraging as proof of similarity, but some information is missing in the comparison of the halves. Doctors Fittiment and Teasdale also analyzed the surface microbiome of the map and the two manuscripts. The results of analysis show that the striking similarities between the Vinland map samples on the left suggests that the parchments share a similar history. The microbiome of the various other leaves on the right are relatively similar to one another, with the exception of the first page of the tartar relation, shown in the center. It's wildly divergent. In part two, we will hear a possible explanation of why that page seems to have had a different history than the others. Additional radiocarbon dating was done in 2018, with samples taken from two parchment and two paper leaves in the manuscripts, as well as the left half of the map. The results indicate that the material they were written on dates from approximately 1400 to 1460, which agrees with carbon dating results of the Vinland map that were done in 2002. A date for the paper text is also indicated by a watermark, which can be traced to a paper mill known to be operating in Basel in the 1440s. This date and location corroborate the theory that the manuscripts were written during the Council of Basel, which occurred in that time period. The manuscript of the Historia Tartarorum, known as the Tartar Relation, was written at the same time as the Speculum Historiale and likely by the same scribe. The Tartar Relation is a famous account of a journey into the lands of Genghis Khan in the mid-1200s. Until recently, Yale's copy was considered the only known copy of this text and was acquired in its current form, this slim, modern, bound volume. In a 14th century copy of the Speculum Historiale, found in a library in Lucerne, Switzerland, which you can see on the left, it was discovered to have a copy of the Tartar Relation bound into the last volume bringing the known existing copies of the Tartar Relation to two. This shows that there is at least one historical precedent for having these two texts bound together. This choir diagram of the Tartar Relation shows where the Vinland map was found at the front of the text. This drawing was in a letter from Yale's Jane Greenfield to researcher Jackie Olin at the Library of Congress in 1983. Researcher John Paul Floyd, author of Asari Saga, discovered information from an 1890s Colombian exhibition catalog in Madrid, which included a detailed description, written by Father Pastor Perez, of a 15th century manuscript the manuscript, which belonged to the Cathedral Library of Zaragoza, was described as containing both Beauvais' Speculum Historiale and the copy of Debridia's Historia Tartarorum, bound together in one volume. 
no map was mentioned in the description. We now know that the Speculum Historiale and the Tartar relation were originally purchased by Lawrence Witten in 1957 from bookseller Enzo Ferraioli of Barcelona in Spain. We also know that Ferraioli was one of four persons convicted of the theft of a collection of rare manuscripts from the Cathedral Library of Zaragoza in the 40s and 50s. These facts taken together make it fairly certain that the manuscript from the Cathedral Library described by Father Perez in the 1890s is the same copy that Yale now owns. Apparently, since that time, that one manuscript first became two and now has become three manuscripts. The Vinland map itself is entirely underwhelming in most people's opinion. It has a shiny bleached appearance quite different visually from the other parchment present in the manuscripts. There are wormholes in the map. They are patched with jaunty squares on the verso. Seen in raking light, the Vinland map shows us it's had a hard life. In transmitted light, the patches and the strip joining the two halves of the map are more easily seen. One of the patches covers a flaw in the parchment rather than a wormhole, and an area of abrasion is visible at the left of the map. Wormholes that correspond between the map and the speculum text were discovered decades ago and have been cited as the definitive proof that the Vinland map is an authentic 15th century work. This animation shows their location on the map itself. This animation shows the correspondence of the holes in the map on the right to holes in the first folio of the Speculum Historiale on the left. As you can see, the matching wormhole placement does indicate that the parchment on which the Vinland map was drawn had to have originally been at the beginning of the text of the Speculum Historiale. To return to the choir diagrams, it may be worth noting that the collation of the speculum on the right shows a missing parchment leaf, the dotted line, at the beginning of the first choir, and a stub, which may indicate that at least one other leaf was removed it would be tempting to conclude that this is where the parchment used for making the map was taken from. But peptide mass fingerprinting has shown us that the outer folio and its missing half are made of goat skin, whereas the Vinland map has been shown to be made from calf skin. However, the matching wormholes indicate that there was originally another full folio, probably blank end leaves, at the beginning of the speculum text. This was a likely source of parchment used to make the Vinland map. The writing and the inks on the Vinland map are unusual. It's helpful for us to compare it with its companions. The script of the Speculum Historiale on the left, and the Tartar Relation on the right, which were likely written by the same scribe, show similarities in their style and their inks. The writing is Gothic in style and has the appearance of typical Iron Gall ink. The writing on the Vinland map in the center just doesn't look the same. The letters and lines have a faded quality, or perhaps a braided. A Vinland letter is shown here on the left for comparison to an area of the speculum text, with some abraded and some scraped writing on the right. An extensive series of multispectral imaging was done on each of the manuscripts to help learn more about these objects and perhaps determine what the ink components are. In these images, the inks of the two manuscripts behave somewhat differently than the ink used on the Vinland map, although the differences are not substantial. Note that the speculum samples in the center are on paper, while the tartar, the bottom row, and of course the Vinland map on the top are on parchment. The extra light application of ink on the Vinland map may be one of the reasons for the inconclusive results. 
what was certain is that more analysis of the materials used to make the Vinland map is necessary. I'd like to summarize part one of our newest findings. New radiocarbon dating of all objects agrees. All substrates were made in the 15th century. The deep marks in the first leaves of the speculum do not match the hardware on the boards. From this we can conclude that the boards are not original to the text. They can no longer be used to prove the date of the manuscript. Both calf and goat skins were used to make the manuscripts, making geographical origin more difficult to determine. DNA testing shows that both halves of the Vinland map are from the same animal and likely the same sheet of parchment. Both halves of the Vinland map share a similar, a similar microbiome, as do the leaves of the Tartar relation and the Speculum Historiale, except for the first leaf of the Tartar relation, which is divergent and may indicate a different handling history. Multispectral imaging gives inconclusive results, but points to the need for more research. Dr. Richard Hark from Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage will discuss the further array of analyses performed on these manuscripts and their results in part two of our series. Thank you. Welcome to part two of the ongoing story of the Vinland map and related manuscripts. New analyses, new evidence. I'm Richard Hark, and I am one of the conservation scientists at Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Given how much has been published about the scientific analysis of the Vinland map, what does Yale have to add to the story of the object that was at one time considered the most valuable map in the world? With unprecedented access to the Vinland map and two other associated manuscripts, the Speculum Historiale and the Tartar Relation, and the availability of tools that previous investigators did not have, we hope to find additional information that would shed more light on this much debated object. Does any of the new evidence overturn the generally held belief that the map was drawn on genuine 15th century parchment using ink with a 20th century component? Let's let the data speak for itself. Before we dive into the details of the analysis, it is important to understand the limitations of scientific examination of cultural heritage objects. We cannot prove something is genuine using the analytical tools. However, we can show if the materials and techniques used to create a manuscript, a painting, or a map are in line with the materials and techniques available for the time and place the artifact was supposedly made. Multiple groups have examined the Vinland map for over 50 years, but our work represents the first extensive analysis done by Yale personnel and benefits from recent advances in instrumentation. X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, or XRF, is a technique that identifies many of the elements present in an object. The capability to make measurements at a single point has been available for decades, but it is only relatively recently that macro XRF allows large, flat objects to be conveniently scanned. The two-dimensional elemental maps that are generated allow one to visualize the distribution of elements in an area of interest. This approach does not require a sample to be taken and is therefore considered a highly useful non-destructive technique. Two of our colleagues are pictured here positioning the Vinland map for scanning. In this slide, we can see a mosaic image of the Vinland map in the top left corner along with three false color elemental maps generated by macro X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. In these images, areas that are brighter in color indicate increased levels of an element, while the darker or black areas indicate a lower concentration or the absence of that element. In the elemental map of iron, we can see bright red areas on the left-hand side of the map near an abraded portion of the parchment, along the vertical fold at the center of the map where there is a paper repair, and in multiple small square areas corresponding to repairs of wormholes and blemishes in the parchment. The majority of European medieval manuscripts were made using iron gall ink, which is made from iron sulfate, known as green vitriol, powdered gall nuts, and a binder such as gum arabic. If the map had been drawn with iron gall ink, we should have been able to see the delineation of the map against a darker background in both the iron and the sulfur images, and perhaps in the copper map, if the vitriol used contained copper sulfate impurities. 
We are uncertain as to the source of the iron in certain areas, but it obviously does not correspond to the text or map outline. Previous studies of the Vinland map involving analysis of over a hundred individual points suggested that titanium was present in the ink lines and not generally on the parchment. Our recent macro XRF analysis confirms the uneven presence of titanium in the ink used to draw the map and write its text and allows for the first time visualization of the distribution of titanium over the entirety of the map. The titanium elemental map you see here represents the accumulation of over 1.5 million individual spectra and clearly shows the areas where this element is present and where it is absent. The highlighted area is labeled Finlanda Insula, the portion of the map meant to correspond to the northeastern part of the North American coastline. A macro XRF scan of this part of the map shows the high level of titanium as well as lesser amounts of barium. The presence of barium is significant because the earliest commercially produced titanium white pigments contain both titanium dioxide and barium sulfate. X-ray diffraction analysis of a 1923 sample of titanium dioxide manufactured in Norway confirmed the presence of barium sulfate in this material. Potassium, which may be associated with the ink's binder, appears in very diffuse lines along the coast of Vinland. The iron map of the same area shows that iron is somewhat randomly scattered on the parchment and clearly not along the map lines or the portion of an inscription that is visible in the upper right of the image. As mentioned in part one, multispectral imaging can be used to visualize the spectral response of ink to different wavelengths of light. When this approach was used to examine the Tartar relation, we discovered an altered passage of text on the first page of the manuscript. The highlighted section of text does not appear unusual with visible and ultraviolet illumination, but under infrared light, small sections of text appear to be different from the surrounding letters or words. The ink used to write this text is darker but responds similarly to ink used in the Vinland map. Its behavior is consistent with a carbon-containing ink and the presence of carbon was later confirmed using Raman spectroscopy. In these elemental maps of the area of folio 3 of the Tartar relation that encompasses the altered passage, we can clearly see that the ink used to write the rest of the manuscript contains iron, sulfur, and copper, markers of a typical iron gall ink with copper impurities. The somewhat confusing appearance of the iron and copper maps is due to the fact that the XRF technique picks up the writing on the recto and verso of the page. This effect is not as evident in the sulfur map because sulfur, a lighter element, emits lower energy X-rays than the heavier iron and copper. Notice in the sulfur map two areas in the fourth and fifth lines of the text where there are gaps. These spaces correspond to areas of the text that were altered and rewritten with a different kind of ink. Our decision to scan this particular area of the page was guided by multispectral imaging done in the early stages of the Vinland map project. This page of the Tartar relation with the altered text corresponds to the same folio whose microbiome was so radically different from the profiles of the other pages that were sampled in the Tartar relation, the Speculum Historiali, in the Vinland map itself. This suggests that something occurred to the recto of folio 3 at some point in its history to alter the microbiome. To further explore this discovery, we utilized an RTAX instrument to obtain high-resolution XRF images of portions of this passage. The element maps show that the ink used to write the altered passage has the same constituents as the Vinland map ink, as evidenced by the presence of titanium and barium. The recto and verso images for a portion of the text are shown. The iron and copper maps correspond to the iron gall ink writing on the verso of the page. The potassium and sulfur maps are less clear because those elements seem to be associated not only with the new titanium containing ink, but possibly with the residue of other letters that once occupied the space on the recto of the page. Another important discovery we made with the use of macro XRF scanning is that the inscription on the verso of the map includes two types of ink. The passage in Latin on the right, which translates as second part of the third part of the speculum, was written with an iron gall ink, as the iron, copper, and sulfur maps demonstrate. 
This passage could refer to a bookbinder's note about how to assemble the Speculum Historiale, which is a massive work made up of 32 books or sections, usually bound in four volumes. A second titanium containing ink was used to overwrite the original passage and add additional words. This new text, which roughly translates in tortured prose as drawing first part, second part of the third part of the speculum, could be viewed as an attempt to connect the map with the Speculum Historiale, a document whose medieval origin is unquestioned. An Iron Gall ink inscription at the end of the volume indicates that the last page corresponds to the end of the third part of the speculum. Yale's copy consists of books 21 to 24, which is indeed the second half of the third volume of the speculum. It has been previously claimed that the presence of relatively high levels of titanium on the Vinland map is not only highly unusual, but totally unprecedented. To further explore this issue, we analyzed 120 ink-containing locations on 50 manuscript fragments produced in Central Europe in the 15th century during the approximate time when the Vinland map was supposedly made. XRF point analysis using a five-minute measurement time was used to ensure better spectral resolution. We also looked at 34 ink areas on the Vinland map using the same analysis parameters. These two histograms show the relative signal intensity for iron and titanium plotted against the number of locations with that level of those elements. You can see that the ink of the Vinland map has very low iron levels compared to the 15th century manuscript fragments, just as the fragments contain much lower levels of titanium than the map. An expansion of these plots reveals how different the Vinland map ink is compared to typical medieval iron gall inks. Note that the purple areas represent the overlap of red and blue bars. We do not intend to suggest that a sampling of only 50 manuscripts is statistically representative of the entirety of 15th century manuscript production, but it does put the relative levels of these two elements in perspective. Perhaps even more interesting is the comparison of the levels of iron and titanium in the ink and parchment areas of the Vinland map. These histograms show that the amount of iron on the map is about the same in the parchment and the ink locations, while the titanium level is substantially higher in the ink. These results are simply a semi-quantitative way to represent what was shown in the macro XRF titanium and iron element maps. Macro XRF can tell us that titanium is present on the map, but it cannot identify the specific titanium-containing component of the ink. Raman microscopy, a form of molecular spectroscopy, can tell us what compounds are present in the ink. In a previous study, Raman spectra were acquired at nine points on the Vinland map, and the titanium species was identified as anatase, one of three natural forms of titanium dioxide. Raman spectroscopy also found that the dark ink component was simply carbon. Like macro XRF, the Raman microscope can be used to obtain maps showing distribution of materials. For example, a Raman map of a small Greek isle that included over 2,000 spectra was acquired. The heat map you see here obtained with the Raman microscope, clearly shows for the first time how the anatase correlates with the black and yellow portions of the ink line as the animation transitions from the Raman map image to the visible image. Similar Raman maps and multiple point measurements were obtained to confirm that anatase is broadly distributed in the ink on the Vinland map. No evidence was seen of rutile or brookite, the other naturally occurring titanium dioxide polymorphs. Various processes have been used for commercial production of titanium dioxide, with a product containing anatase being available beginning in the 1920s, followed by manufacture of a rutile form in the late 1930s. The evidence just presented reinforces what previous researchers had found and firmly establishes that the ink on the recto and verso of the map, as well as a single location on the tartar relation, contains titanium and that this is in the form of anatase. 
But what does it tell us about when the ink was applied to the parchment and whether it is consistent with the medieval origin? Could the annotates be from a natural source? Is the ink merely unique rather than suspect? In order to explore this question, we turn to Field Emission Scanning Electron Microscopy, or FESEM. This required that tiny samples be removed from the manuscripts. Shown here are the sampling locations from the altered text area of Folio 3 of the Tartar Relation. The following slide shows the results obtained for an ink sample that contains titanium and carbon. In the scanning electron micrograph of an ink sample in the upper left, the bright particles correspond to elements with higher atomic mass. Using energy dispersive spectroscopy, or EDS, a technique similar to XRF, false color maps were generated that show the distribution of several elements, including titanium. Focusing in on the titanium-rich area allows one to visualize the surface of the ink. At a magnification of 25,000, the shape and size of the anatase particles are visible. For comparison, a FESEM image at a magnification of 50,000 of the commercially available titanium dioxide manufactured in Norway in 1923 that was referenced earlher is shown here. The classic rhomboid shape and submicron size of the anatase particles first mentioned in connection with Walter McCrone's analysis of the Vinland map, are clearly identified. This graphic shows where samples were obtained on the recto of the Vinland map. Note that we took scrapings of the parchment as well as part of an ongoing effort to confirm the identity of the coding that has been reported by several groups. To correlate with the macro XRF analysis presented earlier, this sample from the titanium-rich southern coast of Vinland was also imaged. This low magnification image shows the bright particles like those seen in the tartar relation sample. The upper left image shows a literal field of titanium with several larger particles of barite or barium sulfate scattered about. A side-by-side -side comparison at the same magnification, though with different spatial scales, of anatase from the 1923 commercial material and the Vinland map sample illustrates the striking similarity of the particles. The rhomboid shape of manufactured titanium dioxide is visible in both photomicrographs, suggesting the anatase in the Vinland map is of modern origin. White pigments containing titanium dioxide were only available commercially starting around 1920. Since the Vinland map first surfaces in 1957, our evidence supports the assertion that other investigators have made that it was produced at some point between the 1920s and the mid-1950s. The presence of barium sulfate mixed with anatase suggests the use of an earlier form of commercially available titanium white. It has been hypothesized that the titanium on the map is attributable to the presence of anatase in naturally occurring titanium-rich clays but we did not find evidence of the aluminosilicates that would be associated with a clay source. Likewise, the naturally occurring mineral form of anatase is relatively rare, and there is no evidence of its use as a pigment. Finally, taken in conjunction with the macro XRF scan shown earlier, we present additional evidence that speaks to the question of whether the Vinland map is an innocent 20th century creation that was later ascribed to a 15th century source, or an intentional attempt to deceive. Four locations were sampled on the verso of the map. Time only permits us to look at one titanium-rich area. This FESEM image is oriented so that we are looking at the edge of the ink layer with some attached parchment fragments. The titanium particles are highlighted in the EDS map and are shown at higher magnification in the next image. The circled areas contain particles with the same rhomboid shape seen on the recto of the map and the altered text passage on the Tartar relation. 
These particles are clearly embedded in the ink and not merely clinging to the surface. As Paula mentioned, John Paul Floyd provides historical evidence that strongly suggests the parchment of the Vinland map had previously been an end sheet in the Speculum Historiale. The matching wormholes were made when the speculum was intact. The individual who overwrote what could plausibly be a bookbinder's note on that former end sheet was apparently trying to establish a connection between the newly drawn Mappa Mundi and the well-known medieval volume of history. We have made several new exciting discoveries about the Vinland map, as well as the Tartar relation and Speculum Historiale, with which the map must be studied to understand the full story of these objects. Our data builds on and extends the careful analytical work done by multiple scientists over the past half century. While the Vinland map may no longer hold the distinction of being the world's most valuable map in monetary terms, it is certainly in contention for the distinction of being the most studied and most debated map in the world. It is our hope that our efforts have contributed productively to that conversation.